thanks so much. It's an honor uh, to be with you. Um, when I was a professor at seminary, everybody knew Jeff Wells. He was a world-class marathoner, and we got regular reports on his races. <laughs> and we, we prayed for him probably more than we prayed for the conversion of people in Dallas. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we do want to pray this week. I've got uh, some team members coming up, some uh, younger pastors who are exceptionally gifted in healing and prophetic ministry. Um, for, I don't know, the last 30 years, I've been praying for the sick. And it's been my privilege to actually see blind eyes open, deaf ears open, uh, people get out of wheelchairs. Um, I've even one time maybe saw someone coming, come back from the dead. There wasn't a doctor there to say the person was dead, but there was a nurse there that said he was dead. So I've seen a lot of healing and a lot of, of miracles in the last uh, 30 years. It doesn't happen every time I pray for someone. Uh, but it happens frequently, and the more we give ourselves to praying for the sick as a way of life, the more healing we're going to see. And so tonight we want to we want to start praying for healing and ask God to speak to us and uh, and and give some prophetic words that might be helpful. Um, but this morning I want to start way back at the beginning with the most foundational question you you could ask, and let me do it with a parable. So, you're uh, coming home from work, and you see a car wreck, and there's a man lying on the side of the road, and he's bleeding, and he is the worst person in your whole neighborhood. He hates God, he hates the church, uh, he is dishonest in business, he can't be faithful to anyone, and you come up on him, and he's got about five minutes left to live. In those five minutes, could he do something that would get him into heaven? Yeah, most of you are shaking your head yes. Some of you are going, I don't know about that. Uh, well, what would he have to do in those five minutes? And you're the only one there. If you leave and try to get help, uh, he'll be dead by the time help comes. It's all on you. So what would you tell him to do? Every uh, year, I would ask my uh, second year Hebrew class that question. And these are students who had had uh, two full semesters of systematic theology. And I would get answers back like this. Uh, ask Jesus into your life. I tell them to ask Jesus into his life. And I go, oh, okay. Just ask Jesus into your life and, and he's going to come. Well, no, you got to mean it. Well, how much do you have to mean it? Um, another guy would go, uh, except Jesus. And I go, okay, but remember, this guy has never gone to church, so he has not a clue what that means. So if he says, what does it mean to accept Jesus, what do you tell him? Uh, well, he has to believe that Jesus died on the cross. Well, oh, is that enough? Just if you believe Jesus? Well, no, he has to believe he was raised from the dead. Okay. Uh, if he believes those two things, is he going to go to heaven? Do, do people go to heaven because they believe right things about God? Well, that doesn't sound right. Uh, and, we, and I would let it go for about 10 minutes like that, and here's what never happened in the whole time I was at seminary. In those 10 minutes, not one student said, the scriptures say. Not one quotation from scripture. It was all kind of popularized uh, uh, things that you, know, you might uh, hear people say, but not one single scripture. Do you know what the scripture says? This is like the fundamental question, isn't it? How do we get to heaven? How do I tell someone I love? How do I tell my neighbor? How do I tell my friend who, who doesn't know the Lord? How do I tell them they begin a relationship with God that will take them to heaven? What do the scriptures say? Do you know where to find that in the scripture? And I find this is one of the haziest questions in, in all the church. And it makes sense. Uh, the devil would try to confuse us on the very fundamental issues of the faith. Well, we've got tons of stories in the scripture. There's one in Acts 16 where Paul and Silas are in, in jail. You remember that story? They cast a demon out of a girl and they get thrown into uh, prison. And, and uh, about midnight they're singing hymns and praying to God. And an earthquake comes through the, the jail cell. And uh, the jailer has fallen asleep. He wakes up and he sees all the prison doors open. And he takes out his sword and he puts it in the solar plexus. And he's about to fall on it and kill himself. 
because that will be a less painful death than what will happen to him for falling asleep on uh, duty. And Paul calls out, do yourself no harm, we are all here. And he calls for lights, he rushes in, he's trembling, and, he, and he's been hearing Paul and Silas sing and praise God, um, and they've been in stocks down at the deepest part of the prison. He's been listening to that, and so he knows they know God, and so he says to them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the question of the ages. And this is Acts 16.31 Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your whole household. It's just that simple. 200 times the New Testament says faith in Jesus alone will cause you to be born again and will give you a passage to heaven. So it's not believing something about Jesus. It's not believing good doctrine. It's actually believing in him. And what that means when, when the New Testament says believe in him, it means we're trusting him. Not just believing about him, but we're trusting him. What are we trusting him for? Two things. We're trusting him for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, uh, in Acts chapter 10, Peter's preaching to Cornelius, and he says, everyone who believes in Jesus, who trusts him, receives the forgiveness of sin. And we're trusting him for something else. Jesus looks at the uh, religious leaders in John 5, it starts about verse 37, and he says, you think you're going to heaven because you know the scripture. He says, that's not right. You're not going to heaven. You refuse to come to me to receive life. So what we're trusting him for is forgiveness of sins and for new life, his version of life. Ours hasn't worked out all that well, so now we trust him for, forgive, for forgiveness of sins and for a new life. We can't just say uh, we trust him for forgiveness of sins. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. I just love the forgiveness of sins. But if it's okay with you, I'll take it from here with my life. I, I'm not doing that bad. That's just trusting him for fire insurance. That's not trusting in him. So to trust, to believe in Jesus is to trust him for the forgiveness of sins and to trust him for new life that begins right here. A new, his version of life in this life and the, and the version to come in heaven. It's just that simple. Uh, 200 times you get that message over and over in the New Testament. Nobody goes to heaven by living a good life. They go to heaven because they trust the Son of God who died on the cross in their place for forgiveness of sins and new life. Now, I want to tell you the story of how I came to learn that. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, my parents never went to church. Um, they had no Christian friends, and later in their life, they had no friends at all. But my home started out like a paradise. My dad was my hero. He was a World War II uh, hero, chief petty officer in the Navy. He taught hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, he had uh, a bomb blew up on the uh, deck of his battleship and, and peppered his whole back with shrapnel. And for two days, he carried men in, into the sick bay, not even knowing he was wounded. Uh, hardly any sleep until, until a, a sailor said, uh, Chief Officer, your, your, uh, your, your back is bleeding. And had this huge knot in his back where they couldn't operate on the shrapnel uh, because it was too close to his spine. So hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. He is a... Little boy, he taught me how to throw a punch, how to block a punch, and how to take a man to the ground, which are valuable skills if you're growing up in Texas in the 1950s. <laughs> when, you're, when your chief enjoyment as a, as a boy is fighting. Um, and he knew the question, he knew the answer to every question I ever asked him. Um, I, I knew that the moon was approximately 240,000 miles from the earth, the sun was 93 million miles, that water boiled at 212 degrees, well, long before I have ever had to sweat through a September afternoon in a cramped desk because my dad knew those questions. He could take me outside and point the constellations out, and, and he knew uh, the constellations. And I watched my dad kiss my mom uh, every day before he left for work, and the first thing he did when he came home was he kissed her at the door. And uh, he told me, he, uh, when I was just a little kid, he said, Jackie, there's not a man walking on the face of the earth that I would let hurt your mom. I would put him down. And uh, so he gave me my image of a man. A man is strong, 
Uh, a man is smart, and he loves his woman. Mom uh, dropped out of high school in the 11th grade to marry my dad. Mom was beautiful. Uh, and she was so tender and so sweet. She used to give me these back scratches, and, and she had these long fingernails, and she would draw her nails across my back, and her palms would never touch my back, just those nails. And uh, I wanted those back scratches to go on forever, and sometimes they did, and I just fell asleep. And she called me Honey as often as she called me Jackie. And for those first five or six years, I was growing up in a paradise. My two little brothers came along, and then for some reason, I never understood uh, mom and dad went to war. And, uh, and, and the more, the angrier she got, she was, raised by, she was raised by a raging alcoholic father. The angrier she got, the more absentee he got until his, his presence almost vanished from our home. And mom took her rage out on us. She called them uh, spankings, but they weren't spankings. They were beatings. Um, I was writing about this in a book, and I thought, I'm, I wonder if I'm being too hard on mom. So I called my younger brother, Gary, and I said, do you remember mom beating us a lot? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, remember that time she pulled our pants down and, and beat our naked butts with rosebush switches? And I went, no, I don't remember that one. That got lost in the fog of all the other uh, beatings. Mom was not a monster. I mean, she was our Cub Scout den mother. She came to all my... Baseball games, my dad wasn't uh, there to, to watch me play and shouted for me on the, on the sidelines. She wasn't a monster. She was just an unloved woman who'd been raised by a rager and didn't know how to get her husband back. And when I was about uh, 12 years old, and I had my, my two brothers were two years each behind me, then we had a baby sister. When I was 12 years old, my dad ended the war by committing suicide. Um, he, uh, he took his childhood rifle, put it between his eyes, and pulled the trigger uh, when no one was home on a Saturday uh, morning. I woke up uh, Sunday morning at my grandmother's house, and my grandmother said, Honey, your uh, dad is dead. And I said, How did he die? A car wreck? And she said, uh, No, honey, he shot himself. And uh, I buried my face in the pillow, and, and, and cried. And for, for a long, long time, I never told anyone that those tears were fake. I mean, what, what's a 12-year-old, what's a boy supposed to do when he hears his father committed suicide? Well, you've you got to cry. And so I cried, but I didn't feel it. I just did it because I thought it was the right thing to do. So I didn't know this, but my heart had shut down long before Dad ever pulled that trigger. In an absence of love, in an absence of experiencing love, that's what a kid's heart does. It's shut down. And I was already becoming uh, a sociopath and, or, or, or exhibiting some of those uh, tendencies. And uh, after my dad died, m man, our, our home, we just went south. Uh, Mom had a 10th grade education. She was really pretty at 34. Uh, but what man wants the baggage uh, of four kids, right? And so we saw this parade of men come in our uh, homes nonstop. Um, tall men, short men, rich men, not so rich men, smart men, dumb men. And they all have one thing in common. They didn't hang around very long. And uh, we saw things in our home, we kids saw things in our home that a kid should never, ever see. From the time I was about 13, I could, we, my mom was working on becoming a morning drinker. Uh, I could uh, mix drinks at our bar and I could, I could, uh, have carte blanche at the bar. And when her boyfriends came over, they, they, they thought it was cool that I could mix their drinks and then knock back whiskey sours. That was my drink. Um, and my brothers were following me. Uh, I became a thief, stole things. Um, I couldn't distinguish myself uh, athletically or academically. So I tried becoming the reckless, most reckless kid at school. I, had, I was in a circle of eight friends. Uh, we're all athletes. Um, I wasn't a good athlete. And some of the guys would go on to get college scholarships, but we all had this in common. We all came from broken homes or homes that were breaking, homes that our parents were alcoholics or they were becoming alcoholics, and there was zero supervision over us. Um, and in that circle of friends, uh, oh, oh and, and none of us went to church. None of us had, we, none of us had Christian friends. 
Um, oh, and the worst thing my dad did to me was not killing himself. The worst thing my dad did to me was when I was nine years old, I asked him how you get to heaven. The question we started with. And here's what he told me. He said, when you die, you go stand, uh, you, you go up to the gates of heaven, and you stand outside heaven, and St. Peter comes out with two books, a book of all your bad deeds and a book of all your good deeds. And he sets a pair of scales on the table, and he puts the good deeds on one side and the bad deeds on the other side. If the good deeds go down, you go up. But if the bad deeds go down, you go down, and you will burn in hell forever and ever. I was nine years old when I heard that. My mom had already convinced me I was a bad boy, and that's when I gave up on God. He's going to send me to hell anyway. I, I knew I couldn't be good. Uh, so why worry about God? Why worry about what? It just be as bad as you can, enjoy it. And that's what I set my heart to doing. I stole my clothes. I stole our uh, beer. I, I became a thief. I wanted to dress nice, but we couldn't afford it. Um, I would drive 120 miles an hour drunk, and, and that was one of the ways I was trying to distinguish myself was by being the most reckless kid in school. Um, I, I was not a good student. No one ever showed me the utility of math, the purpose of history, or the beauty of Shakespeare. And We had no money for college anyway, so why waste your time at school? So I was a failure academically, a failure athletically, and, and working on going to an early grave. And I'm in the circle with these eight guys, and I don't want God, I don't want anything to do with them, and I'm relatively happy. Uh, we got one smart guy in that group. His name was Bruce. Um, this was the, the guy that you could talk to uh, about intellectual things. This is the guy in the sixth grade. He came to school wearing a Nixon button, you know, and said that if, if uh, Kennedy gets it, he'll ruin the whole country, and he was passionate about that. Um, Bruce was a neurotic. He got up in the morning and had to have a Dr. Pepper just to get his, get, get his nerves settled down. Um, and, and, but, but he knew more about sex than all the rest of us put together. He had older sisters who were his source of information. So Bruce, what got him in the group was, was not his meager, meager athletic abilities. It was his extensive sexual knowledge. And he could talk to, uh, for some reason, the girls in school liked Bruce, and he could talk to them for hours on a phone, and they, they would tell him about their changing bodies and their secret crushes, and sometimes Bruce would convey that information uh, to us, and that's what kept Bruce in the group. He's our, our fount of theological knowledge, uh, not theological, <laughs> the sexual knowledge. So uh, the summer before our sophomore year, Bruce chases this blonde named Dixie to a church camp. Yeah, blonde named Dixie, only in Texas. Uh, <laughs> He doesn't catch Dixie, but he catches religion, the worst kind of religion, Southern Baptist, hellfire, damnation religion. And he comes back telling us we're supposed to respect girls and we're not supposed to get drunk anymore. And we said, we see you, Bruce, and we just excommunicated him for our group. <laughs> we would have the, the, the fount of sexual knowledge and now transformed into the fount of theological knowledge, and we didn't want any of that knowledge. So I wouldn't have anything to do with Bruce. He considered me his best friend. And Bruce prayed for me for 18 months. And he got all the kids in church that we had nothing to do with, he got all them to pray for me for 18 months. And about 18 months into his religious life, he conned me into spending the night at his house with the promise that he would introduce me to these two new beautiful girls from Pascal High School. That's the wealthy high school on the west side of Fort Worth where... Uh, uh, the, the great uh, Dan Jenkins, the great sports writer, went to school. We were on the east side, the impoverished side of the city. No famous graduates from our high school. So I go, okay, I'll spend the night with you. So about 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm on one side of the room in a bed. He's on the other side. And I do not know why I ask him this question. But I said, Bruce, um, what do you think you have to do to get into heaven? And Bruce said, well, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. You know, I had never heard that. I was 17 years old. This was December 18th, 1965. I've been 17 for a month. And I had never heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. And you say, how do you grow up in, in, in the, the South when there's a church on every street corner and never get that message? Well, 
It was 1965, and we don't have we didn't bumper stickers back then, and no religious TV. You had to go to church to get that message, and we never went to church. Or you had to have a Christian friend, and we never had Christian friends. In fact, I was 16 before I actually knew who Jesus Christ was. It had always been a swear word, and I saw the greatest in the, in, uh, in the spring of my 16th year, I saw that movie, The Greatest Story Ever Told. The, the critic said it was the greatest story ever told. It's probably the worst movie ever made. And, uh, you know, John Wayne's The Centurion, you know, that didn't fit. Um, and, I, and I saw, then, then I knew that Jesus Christ was a person. And I, and I, I saw the crucifixion, and I, and I thought, dang, he was such a nice guy. Why'd they have to go and do that? Uh, but I don't even remember if there was a resurrection in there or anything. But it, 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 so now I know who he is, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And so on December 18th, 1965, 2 o'clock in the morning, I hear for the first time in my life, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And if you will trust him to forgive you and give you a new life, he will come into your heart and never leave. And my response was, that can't be true, Bruce. (laughs) There's no way that's true. See, when you're 17 years old and everybody you've ever loved has left you, to hear a perfect God would never leave you? Yeah, it's too good to be true. And Bruce said, oh, no, it's true. And I said, how do you know it's true? And he said, because Jesus said so, and Jesus can't lie. And then he quoted the first verse of Scripture I ever heard, John 10, 28, where Jesus says, I give my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. When I heard that verse, I was instantly born again. I couldn't have told you that because I had no religious vocabulary. Confession, repentance, born again. All I knew is when I heard that verse, I said in my heart, God, I'm coming over to your side. That's the way I expressed my faith. But I didn't say anything to Bruce about it. About a week later, I called Bruce on the phone and I said, uh, Bruce, uh, I don't know what you guys call this. I still don't have any vocabulary. (laughs) Becoming a Christian, none of that stuff's in my vocabulary. I said, I don't know what you guys call this, um, but I want to uh, come over to God's side now. And he goes, Jackie, don't go anyplace. I'll be right over. (laughs) He's he's afraid I'd change my mind, you know. And so (laughs) he's at my house within like 15 minutes with the Bible, opens it up to uh, Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, King James Bible, and starts reading, explaining things to me. And then leaves his Bible and says, uh, here, uh, uh, read this. Um, and, and I started reading King James English. And you know what? You know how people, compl- well, you wouldn't know this because nobody reads King James anymore. But back then, everybody complained how hard that Elizabethan English was to understand. Not me. I loved it. It, it just seemed right that you talk about God in a holy language, you know. Uh, it just seemed beautiful to me. And I started reading, and I never stopped. I mean, I loved reading the Bible. I mean, it was so, that Sermon on the Mount was so counterintuitive. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I read that verse, and I go, I don't have to steal my clothes anymore. He'll supply them. It was like, wow, uh, don't forgive the people who are insulting you. Uh, it was just, it, was, it just came alive uh, inside me, and I just I found myself being nurtured. I ended up uh, going to the uh, Southern Baptist Church. Oh, I had uh, uh, two best friends that I loved uh, more than I loved my brothers. And I thought, you know what? When they hear about this, I might get excommunicated. So, uh, so I had to go tell them before we did uh, any damage. And, and one of them was Philip, a big six foot four uh, all star athlete. And, and uh, he, he says, oh, he goes, I knew I never should have let you hang out with Bruce. Uh, he goes, man, don't become a fanatic like Bruce. And I go, Philip, don't worry. I'm not going to become a fanatic. I just want to be, be with God now. And, and uh, he goes, oh, okay. So he, that, that was okay with uh, Philip. So, I'm, okay, I got that relationship. Now I got to tell Teddy. He's the most popular kid in our school, Mr. Eastern Hills. And uh, funniest person in the whole world. So we're sitting in the driveway night later in my car. And I said, Teddy, I'm giving myself to God. He goes, Jackie, what does that mean? I go, well, it means no more uh, drunkenness, no more uh, stealing, 
and uh, you know, no more the, the stuff with girls. And, and Teddy said, well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> and I went, it didn't even sound good to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, like, it was part of the deal. <laughs> I, I, I kind of accepted it, but it, it, and I, and I didn't know what to say. I mean, what's the next step? I was expecting an argument. And, and so I said, uh, I, I'm like 10 days old in the Lord, right? And, and so I say, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to tell you to do this, Teddy, but I'll get you to Bruce. Bruce knows how to do it. <laughs> he's, he's the fount of theological knowledge now. <laughs> and, and so I take, uh, I take uh, Teddy, or I invite Bruce over, and uh, Teddy kneels beside me on the floor, cold floor in December, and gives his heart to Lord Jesus. People say it's really hard to be a witness. Mm, that's a lie. See, I was 10 days old, and I love my two best friends. I couldn't conceive of life without them. I thought if I lose them, my life will be forever gray. They were the principal sources of joy uh, in my life. And so uh, I wanted to tell them about God, but I was only 10, 10 days into the Lord. So when I told Teddy, I totally garbled the gospel. I made it a gospel of works. I can't get drunk anymore, no more sex. I, I totally garbled it. It was like the Lord smiled and goes, look at Jackie, 10 days old, and he's already trying to win his best friends. And he just took his finger and touched Teddy's heart. It's not about our performance. It's not about us being able to answer theological questions. It's just about us loving those people around us and, and telling our experience of God's love. See, a witness is someone who has a story to tell about their experience of God's love. Don't have to answer theological questions. Nobody knows uh, why we got suffering in the world. N nobody's ever going to answer that. It won't be answered until we're standing in the presence of the perfect one in heaven. There are so many problems. You know, but all we need to do, all we're responsible for is telling our experience of God's love. And so one of the most important things to pray for every day is, Father, let me feel your affection today. I pray that prayer every single day. I pray it. The verse I use is Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, not our love for God, his love for us. What roots us, what grounds us in life is being rooted and established in his love. That you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. No one can explain why God loves us like he does. But we can know it, we can experience that love, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It's not how much theological knowledge we have, it's ex our experience of his love that fills us with fullness. So pray that prayer. I mean, I, I pray it every single day. Pray to feel the affection of Jesus. That's where our power in life comes. I want to love God with all my heart and soul, but I can't love someone that I think is irritated with me. And that it's waiting for me to change. That person's really hard to love. But the person I feel loved by, that's the one I can love with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. The key to loving God is actually feeling his affection. It's the key to witnessing. Uh, six months after uh, I had become a Christian, um, my whole family came to the Lord. My mom, my little sister, my two uh, uh, brothers. Uh, and, and I never criticized them. I uh, never said they should do anything different. I just was transformed by love and started uh, loving them. Uh, I pray every day that God will give me someone to tell my story to. That's my morning prayer. Let me have someone to tell my story to today. Uh, st my story is the most powerful thing I got. I mean, I have some sophisticated theological knowledge and, and scriptural knowledge, but the most powerful thing I've got is my experience of God's affection. And before COVID hit, I was in an Uber and Lyft all, uh, all the time, and I would uh, it, it, you know, try to tell my story. I'd not force it on anyone, but just, hey, how did you get here? What did you do? And, and then just kind of let the conversation unfold. And I was riding with a uh, 
PhD, PhD candidate driving my uh, Uber. And uh, he was in a hard, one of the hard scientists, I can't remember what, but he asked me, he gave me an opening to tell my story. And I can tell my story in a one minute version, a two minute, a three minute, uh, and you don't, don't want to find out how long a version I can give. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I can speak at sustained level of generality. Uh, but but I, I, I've just thought about my story, thought about where these, these evidences of God's love and affection. And, I mean, what chance would you give a 17-year-old boy from a broken home, no money from college, alcoholic mom, uh, already addicted to alcohol himself, working hard to become a sex addict, uh, no model of a man he wants to be? What chance would you give a boy like that? None. Except there's this amazing God who loves us whether we're running away from him like I was or whether we're coming to him. And he had a plan for me, and it began with the conversion of Bruce, uh, and he had a plan for Teddy, and it began with my conversion. And he pursued me and opened my heart to believe we have this amazing God of love. And, and I am just uh, daily, well, maybe not daily, but regularly, uh, seeing new facets of his affection and cares. I look back over my uh, story, and I write those down whenever I uh, see them, because I'll forget them uh, if I don't write them down. So I got, I'm in the car with this uh, PhD candidate, and, and so I give him a, a three- or four-minute version of my story. And this is a guy who believes in the hard sciences, doesn't believe in God. I just tell him my story, and uh, his response was, man, that's amazing. I wish I had a story like that. I said, you can. You can have a story like that. You can have a story just like that. People want to be loved. They want to hear a story about God's effect. No one's going to object to that. You're going to object to God saving a 17-year-old bent on killing himself? He's going to die prematurely? You're gonna, anybody going object to object to that? So learn, we want to learn to tell our stories. Uh, of our affection with God, and we want to have people that we're praying for uh, to come to know the Lord. I have, have a small list of people that I'm praying for uh, right now that I'm uh, unbelievers that I, I get to see uh, regularly, some regularly, some I hardly ever see, uh, but they're in my sphere for one reason or another, and I just pray. Uh, pray for them every day, and then pray for that person to uh, show up. Um, God is amazing. He is amazing. Learn to tell our stories. Uh, learn to tell our stories of his affection, and God will honor that. Uh, pray for his affection, to feel his affection every day, and God will on honor that. He will start moving us into that uh, uh, area. So, uh, I wonder if there's, some, if there's anyone here, uh, and you came here this morning, and you never really heard that beginning a relationship with God is about trusting him to forgive you and give you a new life. You never really heard that, but hearing it, you, you find yourself moved and you find yourself wanting to do that. Is there anyone here like that this morning? Just raise your hand if there's anyone here like that. Because we want to pray for you. Oh, okay. We, wanna, we want to uh, uh, pray for you. And, and I think there's a number of people like that. And... Uh, Please come and, and, and see one of us afterwards, but here, here is a, a great prayer to pray. Jesus doesn't come into our life because we pray. The prayer is an expression of the faith that, that it's already welling up in, inside us. So uh, let's all just pray this uh, prayer, prayer together, this prayer of faith. Uh, I'll, I'll pray uh, one line and you pray it after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I trust you to forgive me. I trust you to give me new life. Please come into my heart now. Amen. It's just that simple. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time uh, and you're really trusting him, he's in your heart now and he will never, ever leave. God bless you.